Well, welcome back to another coffee and a chat. So today's kind of, um, maybe I'd say a humbling day for me. Um, yeah, and one of deep thought. So God's been, been dealing with my heart. And a lot of it started with a video that showed up in my feed and it was, oh my goodness, I think it's, it probably was close to an hour long. And yeah, for me to sometimes have the patience to sit still that long, you know, but there was something about it and um, I felt the need to watch it. So um, I did. And it was uh, a man, a gentleman who happened to be a pastor and he's giving uh, a testimony about an experience he had where uh, the Lord revealed some things to him. I won't go into his whole testimony and all, but it basically came down to him thinking he was really walking close to God and, and that everything was really, you know, pleasing to God. And then God was like, no, it's not because, and, and God began to talk to him about how he was actually serving a different God, not him, not Jehovah, not the creator of all things. Um, he was serving this other God. And so as he shared this testimony, it really was, was really um, touching my heart and stirring me. And I knew God was wanting to deal with me on some things. So when I got to the end of the video, you know, and I'm like, okay, Lord, what are you trying to show me? The first thing that God began to speak to me about is that he is not a shallow God. He's not. He is all in. He is deep. And he expects the same from us. You see, as a follower of Christ, he doesn't want a shallow relationship with me. He wants a deep relationship. And I'm like, well, of course, and I want a deep relationship with you. And, and then it was kind of a, do you? Do you? And, <laughs> and uh, so I guess today it's humbling because I feel like the Lord has been holding a mirror up to me to see myself in a way that I maybe wasn't looking before. And you guys, as much as I say I want this deep, close walk with God, I feel very convicted today that my walk is not anywhere near the depth that it should be. And I, I am not okay with that. So um, the Lord took me to a scripture, and this is in Mark 12, and it's verses 28 through 31 that I'm going to read here. And I'd like to read that to you now. It says, And one of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all, or the greatest commandment of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall, here's the commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these with the first one of loving him with all my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. That being the most important. Now, at some point in my life, I looked up the Greek words for heart, soul, mind, and strength here in this verse. And I wrote it down in the margins. So when I went to the Greek, it told me that the word for heart here means innermost thoughts and feelings. The word for soul here means breath and spirit. The word for mind means imagination and understanding and the word for strength means ability might and power so this kind of opens the scripture up for me a little more so if i go back 
and, and read it, that I shall love the Lord my God with all my innermost thoughts and feelings, with all my breath and all my spirit, with all my imagination and understanding, with all my ability, with all my might, and with all my power. Yeah, when I read it that way, I'm like, I come up short. My innermost thoughts, you know, those things that I don't even tell other people about. Do I love him with all of those? Or are those innermost thoughts often contrary? Are they critical, judgmental, selfish? What about my feelings? Am I loving him with all my feelings? Or am I allowing some of those to just go a little hog wild? <laughs> because it's my right. Am I loving him with all all my breath mm. with all of my spirit or do I waste my breath on other things does my spirit chase after things other than him am I loving him with all my imagination oh man don't know about you but that imagination can get me in trouble can't say that I'm loving him with all my imagination or that I'm loving him with all my understanding. <clears throat> my understanding can get real fleshly at times. Am I loving him with all my ability? Am I loving him with all of my might? Am I putting everything into it? Am I loving him with all my power? Or do I misuse that power at times? You see, in, in this testimony that this man was sharing, God had dealt with his heart that, that he was serving a false god. And this man, being a pastor and all, is like, how, how could that be? I, I serve you. I love you. I follow you. You know, it's all about you. I've done this for you. I've done that for you. And God goes, no, but have you? And he began to show him that his motivation that was behind all these things was for another God, not for him. And he, you know, and he was like, but what is this other God that I'm, that I, has been my motivation that I've been serving because I don't understand. And God said, you've been serving the little God, the little G God of S E L self. Wow. I think for me, you know, I, I'll look at things and be like, well, you know, if I'm pursuing money, then I'm serving the God of money. If I'm pursuing, pursuing possessions, then I'm, I'm serving the God of possessions. If I'm pursuing, um, power or a position, then that's the, you know, the God that I'm serving. And, and I didn't, really, I don't think, make that connection that all those things come down to one God over all those things, and that is the God of self. Now, I used to, to know a narcissist, a pretty severe narcissist, and that was something. I've known many narcissists in my life, but this one particular one took the cake. I mean, they were deep in. And a narcissist is someone who loves themselves so much that they make themselves their own God. And, and if you recognize the narcissism, it's very easy <laughs> to see that that's exactly what they're doing. And they destroy a lot of lives because it doesn't matter as long as it serves their purpose. Um, I, I always saw narcissism as being such a, a destructive thing. And yet, I remember somebody saying to me one time, there's a little narcissism in all of us. Because we can all put a, a point where we elevate ourselves over others. 
and maybe not to the degree as a person who's diagnosed as a narcissist because they're so extreme, but we all have that tendency. We all have that ability to put ourselves first and see we're not to have any God over him. I shall have no other God before me. So I know that anytime I let something else be more important to me than God, then I've let that be ahead of him. And I'm making a little G God out of it. But I guess today I'm thinking on uh, more detailed <laughs> things. Like uh, if I'm not... I, to be deep with God, I have to love him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. That That's depth. Anything other than that is shallow. But when I'm more concerned about the things I need to do today than I am about getting in to my quiet place, my prayer closet, my little my little corner that I've made for him and I, or when I'm in there, I'm, I'm kind of rushing through because oh, I, my mind, okay, is my innermost thoughts are, are really fixed on other things, things that I need to take care of or stresses I'm feeling or whatever. When I don't push those aside, when I don't walk forward in something that God has for me because my flesh is afraid, I'm being shallow with him. When I'm more concerned over the impression I'm going to make when somebody comes over for dinner than I am over, I wonder what God's, what God's going to do. I wonder how God's going to speak to them tonight or, or what he's going to do to meet their needs. When I'm more concerned about getting the dinner just right than I am, Lord, what do you, how do you want me to minister to them? How do you want me to sow into their life? What's this really about? You see, that's got me thinking about Martha and Mary. That Mary, she stopped everything and gave up everything because Jesus was there and she sat at his feet to listen and take in everything that he was saying. She couldn't get enough of him. But Martha, Martha's running around the house making sure the food's taken care of and the things are picked up and, and taking care of all those things. And she gets really upset because Mary's not helping her. She's just sitting in there. And she even complains to Jesus about it. You know, tell my sister to get up and help me do some of this stuff. And Jesus' response is, Martha, Martha, Martha. <laughs> you worry about so many things when only one thing really matters. And Mary, she's chose that one thing. She knew the value and the importance of being in his presence. She put Jesus ahead of everything else. She put him ahead of it all. And that's what he wants us to do. That's what he requires us to do. See, how can I have a deep relationship with him and hear him the way I want to hear him and understand things and, and my mind opened up to, to understand the scriptures and, and to be on the alert to what's really going on around me spiritually, even though in the natural it may look like something else. How am I ever to be in that kind of a place when I'm so shallow with God that I can't just block everything out for a while and however long that while takes to just be with Him? That I can't just say, you know what? The food can wait. Being at the feet of Jesus is more important. The house, yeah, it may not be all picked up, but being at the feet of Jesus is more important. It's not that we just neglect all those things. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying here. That when Jesus says, I need you to do this, I need your attention right now, that we just lay everything else down and go, okay, you've got it. You know, i uh, I can't say I always do it in my marriage, but I'm pretty good at it. 
you know, that when Marvin needs my attention, even when I'm in the middle of something, sometimes I'll be, can you just give me one minute to finish this here? But then there's sometimes when you know that, no, he can't wait that one minute. This is too important. And it's like, you know what? I'll get back to it. I'll figure it out. What do you need? What, what can I do for you right now? What is it you have to say? Now I can do that for my earthly husband, but am I doing that for my God, for my creator, for my Lord and Savior? Am I doing that for him? Or am I so caught up with the things of this world and this life? And this preacher talked about how he could see how the enemy uses those things because he's the God of this world. He has some authority here. He doesn't have authority over me because I belong to Jesus, but he has authority over the world I live in. So all he needs to do is distract me, get me more concerned about finding the right truck that will be what I want it to be or finding the right house that'll be just the way I want it. When I'm investing more in upgrading my life in, uh, in material things than I am in investing in his kingdom. I don't know, guys. It's hitting me. It's hitting me in the pit of my heart today. Because I really do want to serve him and be all in. I don't want to serve the God of self. I don't want to be missing. I don't want the enemy to have a victory and distract me. But I have to make the effort on my part. It's not going to just come naturally, that's for sure. And I can never think that I've that I've got there. That, okay, now I'm really close to him, so I'll always be this close to him or closer, that there's no going backwards, because that's not true. I've told you before that there are times when I was at my closest with the Lord, and the enemy threw in a distraction, and just like that, <laughs> it all fell apart. Because I did not keep my eyes where they belonged. I did not keep my ears tuned in where they needed to be tuned in. But that distraction came in and seemed to be feeding a hunger for the moment that only created more hunger, that only created regret and caused me to have to humble myself before God and once again say, I failed you. I need you. Yeah, that's where I am today. I don't want to be Martha. It's worried about so many things that I can't even hear. The Creator of all things who is in my you know in my midst he's here he's everywhere and he's wanting to speak to me and he's wanting to use my life and he's wanting to bless me and do things and when he blesses me you guys sometimes we get so caught up on that blessing being stuff or money and that's not the real blessing. Yeah, those things can be a blessing and they can meet a need. But the real blessing is that I shared Christ with somebody and they said yes to him. That my friend comes over and says, I need God and wants to, you know, can we, can we read the Bible together? Can you help me? That's the real blessing. When my child says, Mom, I don't know what happened, but I got to get back where I belong with the Lord. That's the blessing. When my grandchild says, thank you for all the things that you told me growing up, because I get it now. And even though I have not always lived for him and I didn't always get it then, I get it now. And Grandma, 
I'm going to walk with him. I am in the midst of pulling in with him. That's the blessing. The blessing is when you can sit at the bedside of someone that you love so much as they pass from this life to eternity and you have so much peace and assurance that they're with the Lord. That's the blessing. When you have a choice put in front of you and you can do this thing that is wrong or you can do the thing that is right and because the thing that is right leads you closer to Jesus and and you choose that, that's the blessing. That's the victory. When somebody thanks you for having made a sacrifice for them, when someone stops by and says, hey, I broke down in front of your house a couple years ago, and I don't know if you even remember me, but you prayed for me that day, and I just want to stop and tell you what God's done because you prayed. That's the blessing. That's what I want. That's what's most important to me. And I will say that that hasn't always been true in my life, but it it seems more and more true all the time that the joy in my heart is that God was able to use me in some way to help somebody else find him, get a little closer to him, whatever. It's, it's not, I don't think that God needs me, but that he chooses to include me. <sighs> That's the blessing. If I never have a million dollars I'm good. If I never have a brand new fancy home, I'm good. If I never have anything better than my old clunker to drive around, I'm good. As long as I've got a deep relationship, a deep walk with God, with Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, I was reading in John 1. Read the first chapter of John. I'm telling you over and over. It identifies Jesus as the word. It identifies Jesus as God. He is God. See, that teaching is getting bigger and bigger. Oh, he's not God. He never said he was God. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And so did others. They recognized him for who he was. We cannot deny the deity of of Jesus Christ or Yahshua HaMashiach, however you want to call him, we cannot just deny his deity that he is God. We cannot get caught up in thinking that our existence in this world and being a Christian is about prospering in material wealth. It's not, it's not about building a kingdom for us, but it's about building his kingdom. That's what it's about. We get so sidetracked, so distracted. We can't buy into the lie that eh, it's all good. God understands. He knows you're human. Sure, you sin. It doesn't bother him none. It's not going to bother me either. No, it does bother him. We can't be knowingly walking around in sin and disobedience and be in right relationship with him. Not any more than you could with your parents. And, and hopefully you had good enough parents that when you were disobedient to them, they disciplined you. They didn't reward you for your disobedience. Although I do see some parents nowadays rewarding their kids for their disobedience. We have gotten so out of whack. And yeah, you can just say, I'm just some old lady and that's how old people get. Well, maybe it's because we get smart and we wise up finally. Figures a few things out. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we have allowed to creep in to the, the church and into our Christian faith and call it God, and it's not. So I got my conviction today. And I'm pretty sure the whole day is going to be the Lord and I talking about this. And I know that one of the most important things I can do when God convicts me about something is to find somebody else to share it with, hold some accountability, put some accountability out there. 
So I picked all of you. So anybody anywhere on the face of this planet can tune in and hear my conviction of how God's moved in my, you know, what he's doing in me right now. And you know what? That's okay with me because hopefully some of you will find that same conviction in your own heart. And hopefully today, the day this is being recorded, the day that it gets watched, whatever days, the days that it gets watched, that it will be adding to the strength of the army of God as we become all in. All right. That's what I wanted to share. Yep. All right. I will leave you to your time with the Lord and whatever it is that he might want to do in you. And I'm going to let him do what he needs to do in me. Because I can do better than what I'm doing. I can be better. I can be closer. I need to be closer to him. All right. You guys have an awesome day and I'll talk to you tomorrow. All right.